companies, uh, some institutions, uh, some artists, uh, but also researchers. And we have a series of, of events uh, this year, uh, 20, more than 20, uh, 20 artists and researchers, uh, uh, approximately uh, 30 events uh, until mid-November. And uh, if you want to visit the website, uh, it's uh, franceatlanta.org. And this event, is very, uh, we built a, a partnership between three universities. It's uh, Duke University in North Carolina, GSU, Georgia State University, and Georgia Tech for inviting uh, Uli Matage. She's a curator, French curator and critic. And I'm very happy to welcome you here in Atlanta and uh, enjoy and uh, thanks for coming back. So it is an honor to have with us Uli Matage. Uli Matage is uh, an art critic and curator. She studies the impact of digital technology on urban popular culture in Africa. In her work, she closely follows the works of artists, activists, and theorists who reflect on the social, cultural, political, and economic issues at play in 21st century Africa. For her, science fiction, productions, film, literature, and even video games have been an opportune lens to observe the emergence of art from Africa on the world scene because it is the genre that best reflects the interactions between the present, projections for the future, and funding myths. She investigates the relation of science fiction to gender and race and reevaluates the dominant imaginaries that shape contemporary digital practices. Today, she's going to talk to us about three projects, African science fiction, Afro-cyber feminism, and non-aligned utopias. My colleague Julie Igoni is going to introduce our guest speakers at the round table. Let's give a warm welcome to our guests. I'm going to introduce our guests, and please, uh, next time you speak to the audience, can you just reiterate your name really fast, because I don't think anyone's going to see you in the audience. So, Dr. Elizabeth West, a professor of African American literature at Georgia State University, is our moderator tonight. She's the author of African Spirituality in Black Women's Fiction, Threaded Visions of Memory, Community, Nature, and VA. In this book, from early to modern black women's writings. Her work focuses on those two themes, spirituality and gender in early African-American and women's literature, as well as African diasporic literatures of the Atlantic world. Dr. Gladys Francis is an associate professor of French and Francophone studies at Georgia State University. Her research explores issues of identity formation, resilience, race and ethnicity, gender-based violence, individual and collective trauma, and social cohesion. In France, the French Caribbean, the Sub-Saharan Africa continent. She has recently published two books. The first one is titled Love, Sex, Gender and Trauma in the French Caribbean, and the second one, Odious Caribbean Women. She's the director of Africana Studies Center at GSU. Dr. Susanna Morris is an associate professor at the School of Literature, Media, and Communication here at Georgia Tech. She is a scholar of black feminism, black digital media, and Afrofuturism. She is the author of Close Skin and Distant Relatives, The Paradox of Respectability in Black Women's Literature. She is currently working on her new book project, which explores black women's relationships to Afrofuturism <laughs> and feminism. Dr. Alix Pierre is a lecturer in the African Diaspora and the World program and in the Department of World Languages and Literature at Spelman College. He is the author of 
l'image de la femme résistante chez quatre romancières noires, vision diasporique de la femme en résistance chez Marie Scondé, Simon Schwartz-Bart, Tony Morrison et Alice Walker. He has recently been appointed as the director of cultural orientation at Spelman. Sam Vassi is a lecturer of French at the School of Modern Languages here at Georgia Tech. He combines his interest in political science, French literature and languages by teaching French culture, translation, francophone literature, as well as Wolof. Every summer, he conducts a month-long study abroad in Senegal in which his students live in complete immersion and get acquainted with Senegal's literature, philosophy, culture, geography, history, business, and industry. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, one of our panelists could not make it tonight. Uh, Professor Subak uh, Xavier will not be able to join us. Uh, she, has, she had a last minute family emergency, and uh, she's with her family. Uh, please uh, well, uh, join me in welcoming our, our, our panelists. First of all, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, the wonderful uh, women who have made possible this invitation and this evening. Pascal Bayert from uh, the Cultural uh, Department of the Consulate of France here, um, Stéphanie Boulard and uh, Julie Ogoni uh, from Georgia State University, uh, Dr. Gladys Francis uh, from uh, Georgia State uh, University. And uh, I would like to thank you, uh, each of you, for having accepted to uh, participate uh, in this uh, conversation. And uh, I'm glad, I'm happy, and I'm uh, looking forward to it. Um, alors, um, let me uh, start by a brief uh, overview of uh, my approach as a curator. Um, my, uh, my work as a curator is based on research at the inter intersection of digital culture, contemporary art, popular culture, and politics. I claim my interest in working on an African scale from a Pan-African perspective. But I pay special attention to the local context of the subject. Ghana, Kenya, Senegal, South Africa, for instance, do not have a do not have the same history of technology or digital culture. I'm interested in blind spot, margins, weak signal, low-tech exploration. Finally, I value the need to summon fiction in order to question the present. So as uh, Stephanie uh, uh, has presented it, I will uh, briefly present three projects I've been uh, working the last uh, uh, years. Um, so Africa ISF, Africa ISF is a research project I have developed between 2010 and 2016. If we restrict ourselves to science fiction as it emerged in Europe in the 19th century and in United States in the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century clearly marked a turning point in the development of the genre on the African continent. So I've tried to set up a corpus of works that claim to belong to science fiction. Um, I just show a few examples to also show that it's uh, from South Africa to uh, Senegal, from Kenya to, uh, uh, to Ghana, uh, but I won't comment it, it's just to, to, to show. Uh, voilà, les seignants de film, Jean-Pierre Bécolo, Cameroun, Africa Paradis, a film also from Sylvester Moussou, uh, Kilwanji Kanda, who is a contemporary art artist, and his photography. 
uh, District 9, which is uh, quite well known, and uh, even if it's a very controversial film, uh, it's part of it, and in, in it has also put a focus on this uh, uh, science fiction from the continent. Wanori Kayu, a short film that, that has uh, also been uh, very uh, studied, uh, especially also in, uh, in the United States. Uh, two books uh, that uh, gain awards, uh, uh, one the um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, and uh, the world fantasy for a mediocre for and who feels death. Uh, this is a, a, a contemporary art artist from Sierra Leone, uh, short film uh, <laughs> from Frances Bodono, who live, who is from Ghana but live in the US. Uh, music, uh, animation, video game. Um, it, uh, uh, Olale Khan Jeifu is an architect and a graphic designer. Uh, Milumbe Mbe, it's a cartoon, and uh, um, she has also a short, uh, a short film on uh, YouTube. Uh, Kate Mongo, uh, uh, François uh, Knut is a contemporary art artist, and Kapwani Kiwanga is a, a very famous uh, a contemporary artist uh, uh, who made this series of a performance called uh, Afro Galactica. Uh, in fact, my, my aim. Uh, uh, um, was to uh, explore what uh, this uh, aesthetic was about, uh, uh, and I made a few assumptions. Uh, is uh, Afri a science fiction from the African continent the aesthetic of a changing continent? It is the aesthetic of, a con of connected youth that look to the future? Is it the aesthetic of a society that experiences itself as science fictional? Can we consider that it could be the sociology of a dystopian future? Could it be used as a tool or as a potential to imagine different future? So this is the things that I've tried to put in this, uh, in this research and to, and to develop. But uh, bon, I won't um, go further. The second project uh, took place last year. It's uh, Afro-Cyber Feminism. So Afro-Cyber Feminism is a cycle I have developed with the curator Marie Lechner at La Gaîté Lyrique in Paris. La Gaîté Lyrique is a media art center. The Afro-Cyber Feminism cycle was conceived as a tribute to Afro-feminism, cyber feminism, and science fiction as critical tool and potential space for the invention of different narrative to renew, that renew the view on history of science and technology and reject alignment with hegemonic model. A few words about Afrofeminism. Uh, since a few years, there are a lot of very active collective researcher, artists, uh, uh, journalists in Europe in general, and in France in particular, that who address Afrofeminist issue from an Afro-descendant point of view. And uh, what I've noticed, uh, that's, uh, 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 enormous issue because the, the, the field is big. We have lots of things to, to discuss. But cross-references with digital questions such as does internet contribute to assignment, exclusion, stigmatization are rarely addressed. So this is the site of La Gaité Lyrique. So the programmation has been built around proposal by researcher activists, artists from different backgrounds who share the desire to explore digital technology through the prism of gender, of genre, uh, race, and the place of Africa and its diaspora. So this is uh, some of uh, the um, guests uh, we have invited uh, uh, during this, uh, this cycle. Very important, we were inspired by the series The Paternist by the African-American sci-fi writer Octavia Butler. Her novel, Mind of My Mind, seemed particularly relevant for us to support the ambition of our project. To say, how to weave the thread of an imaginary and ephemeral community. At La Gaîté Lyrique, Afrofeminism took the form of several meetings with different themes at each time. We constantly wondered how to make a programming an open, flexible, and experimental space for work, meeting, and production. How to remain vigilant in order to let the individual concerned decide and speak on their behalf 
and how to avoid any form of appropriation by the institution. The three main axes of the programmation were, first, the official history of science and technology promote essentially European and American white men. The history of digital culture, which has its emblematic figure in the domain of research, counterculture or entrepreneurship, has overshadowed contribution from black women, Africa and its diaspora. How to restore visibility to the presence of black in technology? What is, the place of what is the place of Africa in digital technology? And what are the stories that repair omission or appropriation? The second point was, Internet brought the utopia of a world reconciled by technology, more democratic, more egalitarian, which would abolish difference in age, color, gender, and class. As the process of massification of the network accelerates, there is a huge need to deconstruct this mythology. Indeed, science, technology, and digital technology have gender and racial bias. And third, but digital technology can also be used to fight against gender, class, and race discrimination. I have to say that when we have started this programming, we have quickly realized that this issue was uh, much discussed in the United States, and we have been inspired by lots of African-American artists, activists, and researchers in, uh, in that field. And it was very important for us in France. Uh, in order to extend the session, we have designed um, a website afrocyberfeminist.org to, to keep track of the event, but also to give the name of researcher and artist who, who we couldn't invite due to the lack of time or resources. So it's a place where we have put all uh, the event, uh, uh, the sum up of each event, and a page of resources for artists and activists uh, who um, uh, deal with those issues. This is a, a picture of uh, what happened in, uh, in this auditorium. There were uh, very uh, uh, interesting moments, very experimental, and, um, and voila, it, uh, it's... Uh... Alors, the last uh, project it, uh, I've called the Non-Aligned Utopia. Uh, Non-Aligned Utopia, it's part of a collective project combining research and production called Digital Imaginaries. Uh, it was initiated by Richard Rotenburg, researcher at the University of Witzwaterrand, Wieser, in Johannesburg, and it took the form of workshops, seminars, artist residencies, lectures, debate, festival, exhibition in Johannesburg, and at the ZKM in, Scar in Karlsruhe, which is uh, a Centrum for Kust and Technology, a media arts center in Germany. In Dakar, starting from the notion of utopia, uh, it's, uh, uh, I let it uh, uh, on, the, on the background, just to have an idea of uh, what we have called um, the leapfrog. Uh, this is this moment where uh, the issue of technology on the African continent uh, has been uh, considered as uh, uh, a divide and jump to a leapfrog, uh, mainly due to uh, the use of, uh, of uh, mobile, uh, mobile phone. But I won't develop because it's, uh, it's just to, to, to give you an, uh, an idea of, uh, of this, uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, digital technology on the uh, African continent. Um, so in Dakar, started from the notion of utopia and non-alignment, the research explored the issue and the critical position that accompanied the development of a digital culture on the continent. One reading of this development is that Africa is arriving in the, digital, in the global digital sphere. Our statement was, in parallel or in the fridge, in opposition to these discourses that make Africa the last frontier of the liberal technoscientific economy, critical analyses and position of researchers, philosophers, artists, and micro laboratories of alternative uses are developing. They denounce the Western center character and the technological colonialism of information and communication technology. They therefore denounce their de devastating effect, the most visible of which are the conflict in the mineral mining area, an open air electronic waste disposal site, and also the digital labor. 
those artists, activists, researchers call for a cultural revolution, advocate for the decolonization of art and knowledge that involves the identification of local technical knowledge and the archaeology of ancestral scientific knowledge in order to develop new representation, imagine new narrative and regain the future. These approaches are developed in a Pan-African perspective and involve the diaspora who wants to be part of the continent future. In Dakar, with Kurt Chassan, who is a media art center, a digital school, a school a, a, um, hacker space, um, we, um, it seems appropriate to us to reactivate a utopia contemporary to the first researcher on computer machine, the non-aligned movement. We wanted to retain from this movement with, with the first fruit which appeared in April um, 1955 in Bandung. Uh, what we wanted to retain was its symbolic power, its capacity to federate on a transcontinental scale and collective principle such as struggle for independence, fear desire to think its own model of emancipation, condemnation of all imperialism, intelligent of the margin and solidarity. We wanted to raise this question such as, how can we organize from the South, between bracket, a cyber resistance, between bracket, how, as advocated by the artist Abita Rizaya, is it possible to design and develop digital technology and practices non aligned with, not aligned, sorry, with hegemonic and neo-colonialist model? Are digital technology the product of only the Western culture? Are the laboratory for alternative practices? Are the future, are the uh, future possible? Can we still think in terms of utopia if we consider, like the sociologist Joseph Tonda, that we are under the domination of screen that fascinate and petrify us? Uh, just to finish, I just um, present a few artists and work, um, very briefly, sorry. Uh, so Tabitha Rezer, who has inspired me a lot and has inspired this work a lot. Uh, I maybe we'll have two minutes of presentation of the field. We, we do it not, not right now? Okay. Alors, Electronic colonialism is the domination and control of digital technologies by the West to maintain and expand their hegemonic power over the rest of the world. Sarban warned in 1995 when he wrote, the West desperately needs new places to be here, where they do not actually exist, they must be created, and the cyberspace. Electronic colonialism is one of the many ways in which colonial domination survived after this decade. While settler colonialism was the policy and practice of acquiring, controlling, occupying, and economically exploiting land and labor, which by the way is still the same, it's just now called capitalism, electronic colonialism seeks to influence and control the minds through the digital device. It also operates by sustaining the dependency of former colonized countries on the West by the importation of hardware, software, engineers, technicians, and information protocols. This creates a set of foreign norms, values, and expectations that alter and marginalize local cultures, languages, habits, values, and lifestyles in favor of Eurocentric knowledge. Many countries in the global south have become electronic colonies that are force-fed information generated by the Western world. Under the guise of globalization, the information revolution has become a basis for cultural representation. This um, 
Tabitha Rizer is a French uh, Danese and uh, Guyanese uh, artist. Um, she uh, uh, is a post-internet artist. All her films, uh, which are based on long research on the subject, uh, are on her Vimeo. Uh, so it's very important for her to let people have a look at it. And uh, so it's a film of 20 minutes, so we cannot go further, but uh, it's possible to see this, uh, this film on, on, on her uh, video. Uh, just uh, to uh, pay tribute to her, I just want to read, if I have one minute, uh, I think the, 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 the feel of her research, how can technology be articulated with dimensions that are more spiritual, more physical, more organic? How can we trust the long history of the relationship established by African society between mathematical knowledge and divination? How can we consider the body as a space of resources and as powerful technological tool that can produce, store and transmit information? How can artistic practices become a healing process on the path to emancipation? I want to go, voilà. And very rapidly, some images of this digital imaginary um, project. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot go further. Ooh, ooh. Is it a sign <laughs> that I have to stop now? <laughs> so, well, no, we, we will not see it, but um, voilà. François has worked also with us, uh, with me in Dakar, uh, uh, and developed this project called Dump. Um, and uh, the, this project was after part of a big uh, exhibition that took place, uh, took place at the ZKM uh, in Karlsruhe. And I just uh, present a few images of the exhibition. Very uh, beautiful and important project from Laria Champong also. But, uh, voilà. Maurice, uh, Maurice Bicailly, um, Kofi uh, researcher, Tabitha Rezaia also, uh, architect, and François Knudz. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today as your uh, um, roundtable moderator. I am Dr. Elizabeth West. I'm with the Department of Georgia State University. Um, I, uh, I arrived today thinking that I had a very simple job, which was uh, as moderator to, to sit with my watch and, and be the sergeant at arms. Uh, but I've been told that I need to be entertaining as well. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll see what I can do on, on that accord. Uh, and if I fail, um, uh, let me just say that I have a son and a husband who graduated from Georgia Tech, and they rubbed off on me. <laughs> Entertainment, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, seriously though, we have, um, we have four panelists and um, we will start with Alex Pierre um, uh, and I want to start there because I think you'll be the only person with a PowerPoint, so since you're going to complicate things, we're going to start with you. <laughs> 
and uh, and I'm going to be sitting and watching uh, the time carefully so we don't close everybody here too late. But I, I hope, like me, that you're uh, you're going to enjoy what's uh, ahead. I'm looking forward to it, and we'll get started. to our host. Uh, the title of my presentation is Africa, it's the future and it's the, it's the project. So uh, in 2004, two um, Afro-Beans or Afro-French Afro-descendants, Nicolas Premier, born in France to Congolese father and French mother, and Patrick Ayamon, born in France to Congolese parents, started Africa is the Future, an organization that emphasized the positive image of Africa. In 2004, they released a t-shirt with bold capital letters that simply said, um, Africa is the future. And just so you have a visual, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, so artists such as uh, Pure Coup Des, Inca, Dead Press, and RZA, among others, joined the campaign in the top of the t-shirt. Ten years later, uh, the two partners launched a campaign for a new project which they explain as follows. Imagine it's 2034. The African continent has been renamed the United Republic of Africa, or URA, and has become the dominant global power. The URA is a leader in technology, space, travel, art, film, fashion, architecture, and more. URA's most widely read, most profitable publication is AITF magazine. As the iconic Life magazine covers illustrated American growth post-World War II, AITF magazine covers, covers relate the economic and political rise of the United Republics of Africa. The familiarity of Life covers, emblematic of the American dream, beautifully suits this parodic diversion. This is no astronomer's inspired effort to predict the future. AIT and Congress are an ironic transposition of the world as presented in the international, traditional, and dominant media landscape. And again, these are, these are some you know, uh, copies of, of uh, the magazine. <coughs> Premier, who is a photographer, explained that on September 11, 2001, he was in Congo, Brazzaville, a country torn by a bloody civil war, spent, sponsored and sanctioned by all multinationals and foreign governments that claimed some 300,000 lives. He was shocked by the lack of international media coverage of the African disaster compared to what was taking place here in the U.S., the U.S. strategy, you know, the same time here. What he called the double standard caused him to start the African is the Future project slash campaign. So how should we read this artistic and entrepreneurial uh, venture in light of the title of the round table? What is at work here is a reconceptualization of perceptions and representations of Africa and its widespread influence. To echo some of our um, guest speaker statements, uh, Africa is the future raises several pertinent questions and issues. One, authorship, agency, finding one's voice, the position of enunciation, the construction of knowledge, fact-making, revolutionary pedagogy, critical consciousness, and resisting and countering what Nigerian novelist Edichi Chimimenta Ngozi called the danger of a single story. In the rest, there is a narrative about Africa that has been in place for a long time. In a speech entitled, Not Just an American Problem, but a World Problem, delivered in 1965, Malcolm X stated, until 1959, the image of the African continent was created by enemies of Africa. Africa was a land dominated by outside powers, a land dominated by Europeans. And as these Europeans dominated the continent of Africa, it was they who created the image of Africa that, project, that was projected abroad. 
And it projected African people of Africa in a negative image, a hateful, a hateful image. They made us think that Africa was a land of jungles, a land of animals, a land of cannibals and savages. X goes on to say, but the image you created of our, of our motherland and the image you created of our people on, the, on that continent, sorry, was a trap, was a prison, was a chain, was the worst form of slavery that has ever been invented by a so-called civilized race and civilized nations at the beginning of the world. And I would venture to say that this image is partially still in circulation because of a certain approach to education as the practice of domination, which Paulo Freire calls the banking system of education. To Freire, education is never apolitical or neutral, but rather ideolog ideologically charged. Knowledge is passed on from a certain point of view and with a certain end goal in mind. In Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freire states, and I quote, education as the exercise of domination stimulates the, cred the credulity of students with the ideological intent, often not perceived by educators, of indoctrinating them to adapt to the world of oppression, end quote. In such a context, the teacher teaches and the students are taught. The teacher knows everything and the students know nothing. The teacher thinks and the students are thought about. The teacher talks and the students listen meekly. The teacher chooses and enforces his choices and the students comply. The teacher chooses the program content and the students who are not consulted adapt to it. The teacher is the subject of the learning process while the pupils are mere subjects. With Africa is the future, Premier and IMN propose an alternative to the banking system of education, namely a problem-posing approach. It's present, it presents sorry, African and African-descended men and women as conscious beings and conscious as consciousness intent upon work, to quote Freire. Africa is the future present the problems of Africans and in their relationship with the world, the narrative in which they've been subjects. Imagine Africa in 2034 as the world power instead of the poorest you know, continent or nations, if you, you, you enumerate the 54 nations in the world as it is usually described. The following questions are addressed squarely. Whose story? From whose point of view? With what means? To what end? The two partners challenge the practice of the single story. Here at TED Talk, Nigerian novelist Adichie Shimamanda Ngozi states, the stable story creates stereotypes, and the problems with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete, end quote. Premier and IMO sought out to fill the gap left by the media. By the same token, they were also attending to the question of the position of enunciation, which goes hand in hand with practices of representation. To Stuart Hall, they, and I quote, implicate the positions from which one speaks or writes. In cultural identity and cinematic representation, the British cultural theorist declares, I quote, though we speak, so to, say, so to say, in our own name of ourselves and from our own experience, nevertheless, who speaks and the subject who is spoken of are never exactly in the same place, end quote. Africa is the future highlights the agency of the African subject as, as well as finding one's voice. Historiography, like education, serves particular ideologies and translates specific worldviews. Who gets to write and teach the history controls the narrative. Mer Collins echoes the sentiments in her poem, Cray Cray. She concludes her poem, and I quote, until lions have their own historians, they say, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. Tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter until the lioness is her own historian. In conclusion, let me you know, take you back to the uh, initial statement. Uh, this is no Nostradamus. Remember, this is what the two partners says. This is no Nostradamus-inspired effort to predict the future. 
Africa is the future covers are an ironic transposition of the world as presented in the international, traditional, and dominant media landscape. I'd like to put those two issues in conversation with Collins and the declaration of the griot Mama du Cuyare in Sandiata, an epic of old Mali. And the griot says, I am a griot, master of the art of eloquence. We are vessels of speech. We are the repositories which harbor secrets many centuries old. The art of eloquence has no secrets for us. We are the memory of mankind. By the spoken word, we bring to life the deeds and exploits of kings for young generations. I teach the history so the lives of the ancients might serve as an example. For the world is old, but the future springs from the past. My world, the word of the griot, is pure and free of all untruth. Royal griots do not know what lying is." End of quote. What is Africa is the future, but an example of an African initiative to think about technologies and sciences, and in our case, communication, from a perspective of non-alignment with dominant models and the reappropriations of means and actions. Thank you. I grew up in uh, the French Caribbean island of Guadeloupe when my ancestors did the middle passage and reached land I imagined that the island did not spread open like spread open on the sea like a water lily there is something about passing together, shoulders to shoulders, something about mixing menstrual blood becoming yours and yours, something about smelling together, waiting together, displacing together, making sense of our bodies in the new structural racist and systemic capitalist economies. Something about storing embodied forms of survival and resistance in our bodies. Performance is joy, Performance of otherness, performances of oui, madame, non, monsieur. Performing to touch the invisible motherland, performing to ease the pain, performing because there is no water really spreading open on the sea of semen that rapes, takes, steals, burns, destroys, and gives birth to me. So that's what I do. I look at the palpable aesthetics through which French Caribbean women perform their subjectivity through their literature, cinematic art, performance art, digital and visual art. I examine the ways in which body mo bodily movements are politicized and imagined. I look at the ways in which French Caribbean women artists disrupt cultures of silence, shame, isolation that affect them as well as the women they make visible. I look at artists who like Tabitha Rezer, Lena Blue, Fabien Canor, call for us to respond, see, listen, touch, smell, and taste the radical becoming of black women spreading in the world like a magical rhizome of water lilies. 
They use palpable aesthetics to make it clear that this magic-like, utopia-like image sits atop a complex mangrove-like space. In fact, there is a culture of violence, voicelessness, marginalization, and invisibility for black women on the islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique who perform, speak, love, or behave outside Eurocentric forms or norms. In the French Caribbean, radical feminism is buried under the mangrove. Feminists like the Nardal sisters or Suzanne Césaire took decades to be touched, unburied, or renowned. So that's what I do. Through a pr process that I term corporal memorial tracing, I give focus to how artists, scholars, and activists represent embodied transgressive black experiences through kinesthetic traditions such as dance, urban art, or technology. Hence, I explore the ways in which black communities are affected by neocolonialism, neo colonial mimesis, violent Western desires of hegemony, racist narratives, and negrophobia. I analyze mainstream practices that continue to attribute negative characteristics to black people and how these black communities exposure to such colonialist discourses cause pernicious internalization of negative ideas about themselves and their self-objectification. I focus on artists such as Fabian Canor who construes the sea, the body, spirits, and colonial lands as monuments and archives that, just, that must be retrieved, rehearsed, performed, touched, and witnessed over and over. In the French Caribbean, carnival is a non-aligned utopia during which black transgressive bodies, trans bodies, queer bodies can safely resist repression. During carnival, we observe temporarily and specially determined transgressions, or else anti-hegemonic st strategies to escape or destabilize hierarchy, mainstream idealization of beauty, capitalism, heterosexism, and patriarchal economies of desires. In non-aligned utopias, the woman's body experiments generate raw honesty and sites of self realization that allow the readers or that allow the viewers to touch the body, touch the objects and bodies the woman encounters. Or learn how not to touch that body in inappropriate ways as we, experiment, as we experimented yesterday during Olimata's uh, workshop when we played Erna, um, Hernan a video game in which a black woman must constantly fight hands trying, touching her hair. The construction of utopian futurity is supplemented by a Sankofa experience, a yearning for the past that allows for the creative spaces of reparation. It is, as Quandanima states, a shared modernity where Africanity is hybrid, in and out of time, metis or post-metis, to quote manga, through continuous ways to rewrite itself. These transgressions challenge borders and boundaries found in what the West categorizes as high culture. They serve as a source for reimagining, reimagining, for engaging new narratives on the African diaspora. So it would not be shocking that an artist like Fabian Canard often begins her performances with a list of names of enslaved ancestors based on colonial archives and also based on names that are silenced uh, within neo-colonial archives that she makes available when she names, for instance, Cherise Francis, Tonisha Anderson, Natasha McKenna, or Sandra Bland. Canal's non-aligned utopias do not camouflage her own traumatic presence to history. Her creative body of work is a performance of spasming out blackness, acting out blackness. Canal is not concerned with marketing appeal, what we call in French, l'horizon d'attente du public. Her feminist practices contribute to radical politics of futures, alternatives, utopias, knowledge making as well as engaging witnessing through polycentric and heterogeneous black women. In the context of the Afro-French Caribbean, non-aligned utopias bring forth the many fragmentations that occur at the margins of cultural appropriateness, 
as a counter discourse. We find the creation of an ecosystem that disrupts mainstream decorum. The mutual respect and engagement of cultural differences is possible through an acknowledgement of historical traumas. As a result, we can find and we find an emancipatory politics of corporeality to all types of women, mad women, old women, wise women, pregnant women, whores and virgins, mothers and daughters, maroons and princesses. By exposing both the desires of less desirable bodies and by defining the boundaries of the acceptable representations of female characters, there is a possibility to sabotage both the voyeuristic gaze and the sexualized pleasures. Such modes of representing uglified spaces, transgressive, deglamorified female bodies in pain, and explicit corporal behaviors are the foundation for a politics of negation that serves a productive purpose in terms of ethics and epistemology that can shield them from commodification. These transgressive female characters are hands afforded with opacity and consciously subversive subjectivities. In France, black artists often walk in a setting in which their products are expected to be made from the same recipe, the same batter, and meant for the same audience. In France, black artists must often blend in, make their blackness invisible, fight an industry that does not know how to defend projects for which they don't understand the message or the aesthetic. For them, telling stories that respond to non-French aesthetic results in many blockades. So, how do we restitute the voice of a community that carries the stigmas of une société esclavagiste? How do we represent the dreamed country versus the real country? How do we show the invisible, the forbidden, the secret, the hidden, the shame, and the denial of the self? How do we get rid of colonial imageries to offer new images as well as new ways to tell her story? How do we represent these complex black bodies? Including in material culture, performing, inscribing and reiterating open, moving and complex identities becomes crucial. Artists such as, and scholars such as um, Glisson, Césaire, Canor, Damas, tell us that black people had to reiterate who they were so they would not forget. They had to also perform being other so they would not die again. Non-aligned utopias have been spaces of survival and resistance. My research is also concerned with the transformative power of technology, participation, and the opportunity of self-representation that constitute an embodied cultural form, or lived experiences, increases of the visibly disabled. In this fashion, I analyze the subjective imaginings of the able body about what being disabled constitutes. In our era of global mass media, we observe the dominance of sensational branding, shock-driven culture and aesthetics that spread to information, entertainment, and facts. They create confusing environments the public is left to read and interpret. These mediated representations are imbued with issues of power, and as such, their spectacle affects social relationships between individuals. These practices have become common in contemporary society, gradually limiting our freedom by supporting and at times reinforcing forms of inequality and oppression. In fact, scholar Freud presents media discourses on the social impairments of disabled, elderly, and poor African Americans as a narrative prosthesis. In this fashion, African American lack of is stigmatized as a racialized pathology their lack of social mobility becoming, for instance, a pathology, making them responsible for not evacuating their homes for Hurricane Katrina. In short, African American suffering is really getting to their own fault. In the forthcoming article uh, that I have with Cambridge University Press, I discuss non aligned utopias in the second line of New Orleans, where disabled bodies, systematically excluded, discounted, and devalued, are made visible. I analyzed New Orleans brass bands, Southern Lines, as a space in which disability moves from need of intervention to creative asset. In fact, in this context, 
Disabled bodies create space for themselves within the urban landscape, within agency and self-authorization, inside systemic racist policies that limit and control how and where they move. There is this popular practice in the French Caribbean that occurs solely when, um, during the wake celebration of people transitioning. Uh, as you probably know, when we say transitioning in the African diaspora, we often mean that the deceased can now make a utopian return to, Af to, to motherland Africa. In the French Caribbean, the wake is a celebration of life. I would like to share one specific practice during which a storyteller gathers people in a circle. In Creole, he tells proverbs about life, he transports the audience in another time, another point of aperture, a tangible liminal space. At the end of this complex journey of enigmatic stories regarding life, he asks us to join our hands, hands. he approaches every single one of us and puts something in our hands. The moment is quite mystical because in reality there is nothing inside our hands. The reason being that he simply gave us back to ourselves. As a curator and critic, Ulimata Gay creates similar species of aperture, of liminality for artists and scholars, but also for everyday people often left aside in academia and ignored by the mainstream. I want to commend Ulimata for her ability to provoke, to gather, and to create an inclusive cycle of convergence, of discussion, and critical thinking regarding such important afro diasporic diasporic issues. I also want to thank Dr. Boulard for bringing us together to discuss our visions on non-aligned utopias. I believe that we need to document, archive, Afro-diasporic works and counters and mnemonic transmissions, just as we must create space to let people of the African diaspora own and talk about what it is that they carry. Through non-aligned utopias of creolized bodies, we move beyond blackness, or the creolized body as a fetish or an object, or what Marie Condé named a passive dichotomy. Calling for Derrida's generative and irreducible multiplicity, non-aligned utopias are an invitation for borderless cultural mutations. Hence, probing the embodied knowledge of such repertoire contributes to decolonizing the ways in which the mainstream obscures and devalues Afro-diasporic repertoire, intangible traditions, and embodied knowledge pertaining to the global South. So, Ulimata, I want to thank you for the gatherings you've provoked over the past years. I was very impressed with the afro feminism website you and your team curated. It reminded me of the Petit Pierre organization in Dakar. Creating such spaces for such conversations, exchanges, and transparency on African research inscribes his works in what I call the historical archives of public records. Thank you for the aperture, the tangible liminal spaces you fostered around technology issues. Thank you for deconstructing our intricate and rich mangrove space. Because in reality, as illustrated in the wake popular practice, and those who receive the storyteller's gift. What we need to give to the Afro communities we encounter is simple yet tremendous. We need to give them back to themselves. Thank you. Faces. I know you're thinking really deeply. I'm not going to take my full 15 minutes. I want to engage with y'all with some questions, and that was a hard act to follow, so here I am. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk a bit, and I'm going to read a little bit. I want to talk about how I came to Afrofuturism and my connection to afro feminism. Um, so, when I was a youth, before the internet was a thing, I went to the library every week, every weekend, got on the bus, drove across Broward County, Florida, went to the library and did this to the science fiction show, and to the history show, and to the fantasy show. 
And one day I went and I found two important books to my development. One was Julia Alvarez's How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accents. I'd never read about Caribbean immigrants in that way as a, a daughter of a Caribbean immigrant, two Caribbean immigrants. And I also found Parable of the Sower. And on the cover, there is this sort of alien figure who is obviously a black woman. And that changed my life. And I like to tell my students, you can blame that book on making me who I am. Because that's what brought me to this idea that, OK, black folk exist in the future. Maybe that seems like an obvious thing. But growing up at the end of the 20th century, where I had the Jetsons or all these other pop cultural figures that didn't even show black folk at all, we were not central to visions of the future, reading texts that lied and erased or completely omitted black folk, or included us as um, dangerous foes that should be vanquished, right, in the face of the future. Reading Octavia Butler's work all those decades ago was integral to my life and really saved me in particular sorts of ways. And I think her work, as, as your work shows, is foundational in an international, interdiasporic conversation that black feminists are having about what being black and what being a black woman or black person in the future means. Uh, I want to invoke our recent ancestor, Toni Morrison, and read a little bit from um, an essay, or rather a speech that she wrote, uh, that she gave uh, in honor of Amnesty International, and it's called The War on Terror. War on Error, for Islam. Toni Morrison outlines what she sees as global confusion at the turn of the 21st century, a series of, quote, social perversions from inept governments to, the, uh, to media that shields for corporate interests. She wrote this about 20 years ago. She laments the lack of imagination in public discourse, and I quote, a prime example is the inability or unwillingness to imagine future's future. The inability or unwillingness to contemplate a future that neither afterlife nor the tenure of grandchildren. The time itself seems not to have a future that equals the length or breadth or sweep or even the fascination of its past. Infinity is now, apparently, the domain of the past. And the future becomes discoverable space, outer space, which is in fact the discovery of past time. Which I think is connected to um, what the, the video that you were citing that talks about cyberspace as a colonial space, which I hope we can talk about. Billions of years of it, random outbreaks of Armageddonism and persistent apocalyptic yearning suggest that the future is already over. I think that's particularly interesting, and maybe I can invoke Paul Gilroy a bit here, thinking about um, postmodernism, right? This idea that postmodernity, take it out of the wrong literature. Uh, this idea that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, after World War I, after World War II more specifically, that Western subjects really felt like the world was over, right? Trench warfare, the disappearance of like, the greatest generation and so on, that, that wrecked our understanding of the world. But for people across the African diaspora, the world had already ended and been broken up centuries before. And so our imaginings of the future have always been speculative, right? Um, have been speculative for a longer time than, say, the late 19th century invention of science fiction would invite us to consider. Uh, I want to continue a bit with Morrison, because she's always good. Here, Morrison clarifies the obsession with the past, seen even in our definitions of the present that have prefixes pointing point backwards, such as postmodern, post-structuralist, post-colonialist, post-Cold War reflects an anemic understanding at best or abiding fear at worst of both the present and the future. As Morrison suggests, isn't it reasonable to assume that projecting earthly human life into the far distant future may not be the disaster we have come to love, but a reconfiguration of what we're here for, to lessen suffering, to tell the truth, raise the bar, to stand one remove from timelessness like an artist imagining reflection stoking imagination, mindful of the long haul and putting his or her own life on the line to imagine work in a world worthy of life. That's Morrison, okay? I think that Lamada's work um, with, and the sort of group's work with Afro-cyber feminism is part of this long-range discourse that includes Butler and Morrison and further back to even our friend Phyllis Wheatley 
and folks like Julia Foote in the 19th century and Mariah Stewart, right? There's this long line of black feminists who've been engaged in in this sort of futurist projection and this speculative thinking. Um, in my last few minutes, I just want to draw our attention to two examples, two contemporary examples, um, one of which um, we might uh, refer to. One is um, Muhari uh, Kaye's, um, I probably mispronounced my name, I apologize, Humzi and Janelle Monet's uh, Dirty Computer. Two short films, one called An Emotion Picture, because Janelle Monet is very cute about that, and I like it. Um, and Poomsy, which is a, a, a short film, right? And both of these movies invite us to consider radically different futures, and I think that they connect to this idea of afro feminism in a couple of ways. I'll start with Poomsy. I'm gonna give a little bit of a spoiler, so my apologies. Both of these films are available on YouTube, and you should put them in your queue now and watch them when you get home, okay? Uh, so, Kumsi imagines this dystopian future in which our protagonist, Asha, uh, is sort of is trapped in this dystopian uh, governmental regime. Everything is controlled down to what people wear, um, and their dreams are controlled, right? They have to take medicine in order to not have dreams. The outside world is completely desiccated, right? It's dry, and they have to reuse water. So folks are on treadmills. This is before that episode of Black Mirror where they were on the treadmills. I know you were thinking that. Uh, using their bodies to power things, reusing urine, um, eliminating the waste and taking the water out of it. So extremely dry conditions. And she gets this secret package in which there is a seedling in there, right? And she wants to go against the governmental structures and plant this tree and see if they can resuscitate life. And she does so at great personal harm. I won't go any further on that film. But I mention that because rather than this voyeuristic um, Armageddonism that Morrison warns us against, this film invites us to consider that, yes, perhaps at great personal cost, we can fight things like climate change. We can reimagine the Anthropocene, right, which is the era that we're in now, in which human error and human terror have changed the uh, the air, the sea quality, water, all of that, right? That's the era that we're living in now. Uh, the film invites us to consider that there is a different possibility of the for the future. We may perish, right, in reimagining and fighting for and being activists to change this future, but that we can actually change it and things are not inevitable, right? Rather than the sort of do nothing um, apocalyptic scenario that we seem to be um, engage with both at a local and a global level, level, this film says that there's something else that's possible. I'll close by talking about Monet's emotion picture, Dirty Computer, which is basically um, emblematic of black girl magic and black boy joy and black non-binary amazingness and all of that, right? It imagines this queer, um, polyamorous future, right? That obviously would be under attack because there are haters out there the haters of heterosexism and transphobia and homophobia and all those other things. But Monet, uh, who plays Jane, lives in this future where uh, the government is trying to curtail any kind of queerness, any kind of blackness, or um, non-Western culture, right? And rather than succumb to that, Jane and her friends actively fight against um, the institutions that we want to erase, literally erase their memories and erase who they are, right? And there's more to the film, but I want to put both of these in conversation with one another because I think it speaks to this global effort that Ulamata was speaking to earlier where black women and black non-binary folk, black queer folk have been really been interested in both creating art, right, and critiquing culture that looks at this complicated view of the future that is not wholly Western and in fact in fact, invites uh, more blackness, however we can figure that across the diaspora, across the globe, as central to the proliferation of humankind, right? Actually, we need more blackness rather than less blackness to survive all of us, right? So I'll end there. Thank you.
mistake is not coming fast enough. <laughs> Even sometimes when you have a movie like Black Panther, the very first scene you have, you know, that great sound by, by Bob Omar, the Senegalese artist, everybody is happy. The next thing they do is speak English. <laughs> like, okay, what, where are the subtitles? Why are they sweep, uh, sleepy, um, speaking Swahili, Wolof? Since we're always talking about the way we want to be perceived, we have got to be able to write our own story, our own history. If I look at everything that we've been told since the 1960s, oh, we're independent now, and what's going on? Misery, plundering, looting, I don't know, scientific experiments. That's pretty much everything that the West told us that that was the way we are. That's exactly how we live until pretty much recently. I mean, I went to, I'm com I come from a country with a Western style education. I speak French. I learn French. My family learned French. Great, wonderful. I know that now Flaubert uses a semi-common Great, and I hope my 19th century specialist colleagues are not here <laughs> <laughs> to hear this. And I'm also thinking that, uh, yeah, slang in you, Hugo, Victor Hugo's book, that's great, doesn't get me anywhere. That's not my story. That, that is not my story. And I, we cannot keep on blaming them, no. We cannot keep on blaming the West. Because after all, we had government in the 1960s. We were supposed exactly to put us on some way, somehow, a path to development. Fail for many reasons: corruption and uh, also, uh, I don't know, influence of the uh, of the West on whatever we were trying to do. I mean, today, the School of Modern Lang Languages has a program in Senegal. That's rather successful, and if we, whenever we go there, you, I mean, you go to the both authority, French uh, company, Bolloré. You buy gas, Total. Communication, Orange, uh, Areva. So it's never <coughs> ending. How, what can we do as uh, African if we know that we have all of that? all those issues and how can we take care of them. Like, and in the world of Sami Chak, you know, when are we going to stop blaming all these people and pretty much take responsibility for our own future? There are a few ways that uh, you know, people have been uh, talking about. Some of, us, some of them you have heard already. Uh, we had this talk about revisiting all the archives. They have universities now in uh, Senegal, especially at uh, uh, Gaston Berger in uh, Saint Louis. They have the, like a department called Crack. See it in like hear it in French, not in English. Like if you hear, like Crack in French, meaning uh, you know, like a an expert, a champion. That's civilization, religion, art, and communication. That's pretty. That revisiting the African history so that it can be taught to people who actually will have, for example, to deal with 500 years of some way, somehow, uh, loss of uh, confidence. So we, we do have that. We also have uh, things like, uh, why am I not speaking my own language? Why am I not, why aren't you learning, all of you, why aren't you learning all of you know, so we do have that. So most writings that we do now is just we try to include a lot, 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 lot more native languages in whatever we do. That's still great. But this is what gets me though. Know? I think we gotta do a lot more about our culture. If I look at the, the youth in Senegal, they do great things. They do great things. Hip hop, they Constantly, uh, I mean, they really engage. You get the uh, social movements that will actually pretty much get rid of uh, government. But the thing that really got me when I talk about, uh, you know, utopias. A few years ago, I saw a collection of uh, pictures 
from a Kenyan artist. She is, I think the, the project was called Masai, M-W-A-S-C-Y. Everything is the, in those pictures told me that that shouldn't make sense. Because you see the Maasai people wearing their garment, their traditional outfit, just everything, but some of them are riding rockets. I don't like science fiction, but for some reason, I thought, okay, this, does, this cannot possibly make sense, because you know that somewhere, somehow, you should be obliterated somewhere. You know, you shouldn't be able to, uh, I mean, to, to breathe. But that's the, 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 uh, the picture that actually did it for me. Because he represented pretty much every single little thing that I am. He represented the past. So, uh, seeing those Maasai with their traditional outfit and something else that, and I don't like science fiction really, so, seeing them on those rockets did it for me, I think. That's where the future is. Imagination, we have got to use as much of our imagination and our culture that, that we have to pretty much uh, be seen the way we want to be seen. So, thank you.
you know, it was it was a way for her uh, to see the future by going by going back to the past. Uh, Morrison as well. Uh, Morrison's work is steeped in a kind of super real world, uh, but it's a world that always reaches back to the past to understand, to be able to build uh, to build on the future. Um, and so um, I would kind of like to open up our conversation uh, with that in mind uh, and to uh, ask the question, uh, I, I think a couple of times uh, this, this opposite of utopia was mentioned and, and that is dystopia because I, we can't always assume, although we would like to, that you know, art brings us into this world of of you know, uh, positive possibilities. Uh, art sometimes takes us to the dystopic as well. Uh, and where, you know, where, are those brown, where, where are those boundaries, especially when uh, we're looking at art uh, and its ties to, you know, to sci-fi and digital humanities, is it necessarily uh, a future, uh, a utopic future? Uh, so, that's the best I can give you on, on making an attempt at weaving all of that, and I want to open it up to uh, questions. I actually wanted to go back to what we discussed in the beginning of uh, 
to Sir Ben, um, talking about the, um, the colonization of the internet. I wanted to, or the internet and cyberspace specifically, I wanted to ask, um, what, what do you all think that the first steps to decolonization of cyberspace would entail? Um, so I think, uh, go back to uh, Tabitha Vizaya. Uh, and uh, maybe give a few uh, examples that are uh, really uh, important for me. I think that uh, in our work, Tabitha Vedaira um, reappropriate the world, uh, the world, you know. You know. Um, and for instance, uh, uh, like um, uh, Octavia Butler, uh, uh, reappropriate what does it mean, technology, for instance, and that our body is a technology. And, uh, we can uh, um, learn this technology, we can use it, we can benefit from, from it, we can we, um, we, we give another uh, a sense to uh, technology, uh, circulation of information. Uh, we, if we consider that uh, uh, we are in the cosmos, uh, there are many ways of uh, 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 tracing the circulation of information, which is not only um, the uh, 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 information and communication technology has defined what is information. Um, and um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a way to uh, uh, enter in this uh, process of reconsidering uh, what we are living with, and especially the, the world. Uh, and uh, to give another uh, uh, indication uh, following the work of Tabitha Reza, it's the idea of healing. I want to say that uh, uh, Internet has made us sick, sick so uh, she, uh, she presents herself as a healing activist. And uh, uh, we can start a, a healing process uh, to decolonize ourselves from uh, um, technology that uh, uh, maybe is not that good for, for us. Um, and uh, uh, also, uh, what I've also learned from her, which is very important, is to bring, to, to, to put in, in science spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have a history of science that are separate, uh, science mm -hmm. and spirituality. And uh, we now learn when we look at uh, 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 science uh, on the continent, when we do the archaeology of knowledge on the continent, that uh, uh, there is a vision of science that has never separated the spiritual from the scientific, for instance. So I don't know if I answered the question, but yeah, maybe it could be some. Can I ask you a question in relation to this question? I just read an article that said that in Rwanda, they're starting some new, completely Rwandan-owned cell phone company. And in your presentation, you brought up some of the resource mining that's happening in the continent in terms of what's in our actual cell phone. Um, and I'm so when I hear your question, I think, like, like people, you know, African folks need to own the means of production, right? Like, that's one way that we, but if, going back to what you were saying, that people don't have the right business practices, than owning the means of production, owning the company, but if you have bad practices, I'm thinking out loud, but I'm interested mm -hmm. in what you think about the some of the tangible stuff. You said a lot of the like the mass production, creating your own mm -hmm. production, that's So you don't have orange, or you don't have Verizon, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, um, I think, what we were looking in this project of uh, the digital imaginaries and uh, non aligned uh, and, uh, and the first thing for me is to say there is alternative. There is people that think about it. There is people that are very well formed to uh, technology, uh, and they know what they are talking about. But and they know when they want to raise an alternative uh, where they speak. They speak from the point that they, they know uh, uh, what they want to do. Uh, and I think. Uh, uh, to come back, I think, to, to you and your, your uh, focus on art, I think that uh, uh, for the moment, for me, I think it's the field of art that do the best for, for the moment. 
to imagine that uh, we are not happy with what happened at the moment and that we can imagine uh, some uh, alternative. So it uh, brings me to the last uh, point that we still need to work to, for that to happen in, in real life, definitely. Definitely. I, um, um, I haven't been to Rwanda, but I, I would love to go there. Uh, and I know that Rwanda has a focus on the digital land. But I'm worried about this focus, and I wonder if it's really, uh, uh, if the, the, the aim is to keep the technology as it is and to say, look, we are at the same level as the rest of the world. Or if there is opportunity to say we do not want this kind of technology and we are totally uh, in capacity <laughs> to make some research and to make some development, to uh, imagine something else. There is lots of field where scientific can, 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 can look, can, can make some research very, uh, very in education, uh, uh, in the content of, uh, of uh, those, uh, those tools uh, uh, to, to, to teach uh, in a different way, to uh, learn different things. Uh, but also, uh, uh, and uh, I agree, maybe uh, to think in terms of fair phone from the country, uh, the fair industry from the country. Okay, I think we have time for probably two more questions. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of come back to this idea of being like you know, the starting point for if anything. Yeah, you talk about how art is how innovation, say that uh, we have to, first of all, so it was important for him to put this spacecraft in the place where uh, grassroots makers are uh, uh, recycling e-waste, uh, first of all, so to be at the center of where the people do, do that. But it was also a, a, a space, this spacecraft, he called it a spacecraft in reference to science fiction, uh, it was a place uh, where he could invite engineer, uh, his student from the STEM, to come and meet the grassroots maker and to join that force and their knowledge to invite, to in invent um, like a R&D innovation point, to invent new form of recycling that are less polluted than burn the, 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 the plastic to, to, to get back the copper. Uh, and um, uh, he said he, he claimed that uh, 
this uh, uh, is a, a, well, it's pan-Africanist perspective. It's an open source uh, uh, prototype. So if you go to his website called Camp, you can download the way to build this uh, uh, unit, the R&D production unit, and it's a pan-African project. And uh, he called uh, this demarche as a sample for innovation in reference to the Adinkra symbol of the birth. And he's, the body is in front of, uh, of us, but the head is uh, looking at the past. And at the knowledge we have, we have gathered. Uh, so never forget that uh, uh, we cannot just uh, um, innovate, uh, design from scratch, but uh, uh, it's more valuable if we acknowledge and we take into account as well. And uh, in another way, uh, Nicolas Premier is also a graphist and an artist. Uh, there is lots of, uh, uh, yes, uh, ceramic of the who uh, uh, are mixed uh, their approach. <coughs>
Cincinnati. So I met a very interesting paper about one researcher who was quite early state for the new figure of success. And uh, uh, he explained that uh, uh, after the uh, devaluation of the uh, state of France, 1994, uh, the youth, uh, realized that uh, it was it has a, a, a dramatic impact, uh, especially to take it in uh, It was really uh, very, very heavy. Uh, uh, the middle class has suffered a lot. Uh, it's, it, uh, of course, poor people, but uh, it, it was, I think it's kind of traumatism, uh, this history. Uh, so it was a resolution of the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, it was the period of the political, the politic of uh, ajustement structural, uh, and uh, he said that uh, the youth uh, said, "Okay, we cannot longer rely on the family because uh, it's not possible anymore. So we have to rely on ourselves." Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two figures that emerged from this period. It's the la lutte, le lutteur, uh, uh, and the rapper. Those are, and, and uh, one of the most famous, uh, 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 what's the name of the editor in English? Wrestlers. Uh, 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 his name was Tyson. And he came in the stadium with an American flag. Uh, and uh, of course, we all know that uh, the rap uh, was uh, at the beginning, because it has been very, very appropriate by the young Senegalese uh, singers uh, from the US. So I think also there is those elements that also um, um, need the youth maybe to embrace also this liberal culture, to say maybe it's the only way that we can get out of this mess. <laughs> Generation Bullfale mm. means that like, in one of the like, uh, Bullfale, okay. that I don't care. That like, generation, I don't care. I pretty much do whatever I want. But it's still the same people, no matter what they did in the next uh, 15 years, still want to go abroad. But with everything they achieve, they still want to go abroad. Which, for example, I don't know if it's, uh, we should see it as a failure on our part or not. Wait, for about 20 years, yeah, great, but why do you want to leave that? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in with the power of the moderator. <laughs> uh, and do you want to have one more question? Yeah. Um, okay, one or two more. Uh, uh, and then I'm gonna, as the moderator, uh, impose one other thing. I, I just want to say that the question is
think as you know the presentations have shown, it's not so much about an outside in, it's recognizing what's already there, right? So there were so many examples across the panel of um, artists, writers, thinkers on the continent, just, not just the diaspora, the diaspora is everywhere, right? The continent and all the other continents. When I say the continent, I mean it. So I think rather than it having to like, have a US American imposition like, and going to another place and being like, hey, this is how we think about the future, y'all are the future. It's like following people's leads because there's already stuff happening. Mm -hmm. It's really, I think it's really about being in conversation and amplifying right. one another's work rather than doing any kind of position. I think it's already there. Um, and it's just about those of us who are in the West doing the work to find the work that's already there, right? Yeah. And then being like, how can we be in collaboration? How can we be in conversation? How can we learn from, right? So um, an example that I teach about from time to time, and, and, and Nidia Korofor is Nigerian American. She writes a lot about stuff on the continent. Um, last week or the week before I taught, um, Binti, which is a so she calls an African futurist, right? She really wants to focus on both writers and artists from the continent who have really close direct ties rather than focusing on US American ties solely, right? And so she's created this term and she imagines the Hindu people who live in Namibia and Angola, right? And they're a semi nomadic tribe. They use this red ochre paste in their hair on the skin. Women do anyway, it protects them from the sun, makes them smell nice, it gives them cool locks. And she imagines them in the future, right, traveling interstellar, interstellar into space, right, rather than um, parts of Africa being backwards or having to be taught in the dark continent, right. rebuking that notion and saying, again, futurity, like Africa is the future literally and figuratively, right? So I think I'll just push back a little bit and say, we have to, those of us who are in the West have to go directly to the source and learn it from and then be in collaboration. tonight. Thank you very much and thank you Limata for being here. And cherry on the cake, there is food outside with dessert from the chef. Okay, so enjoy and let's talk outside and continue the conversation if you have more questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you Yes, yeah. all together with Limata and also with Tony. Can you help me with that? Yes. 